Okay. Hey, thank you. And I apologize. I have a little bit of a cold, so I have to have this cough drop. Uh, hopefully it's not distracting, but uh, thanks Alvin for inviting me to give this guest lecture. I hope everyone can see my screen. All right. Um, ironically, I'm actually teaching this series at MIT uh, next week. And even more interesting is I'm flying to MIT to teach it in person, but I live only about 40 minutes from Berkeley, but I can't teach it in person with Berkeley. So um, part of my, my little inside joke here with Alvin is I forgot to mention that I'm teaching this same uh, two-part series at MIT until uh, earlier this week. And he, he mentioned that, oh, all the slots are full. So, but I left the part one on there because my hope is they will record the second lecture at MIT, and then I can make this available on my YouTube channel. And you can watch the second part if you're interested based on what you see on the first part. Uh, so thank you all for joining. And uh, as Alvin said, I'm a principal AI scientist and I'm the director and founder of machine programming research at Intel, and also an adjunct professor at UPenn and the steering committee chair of the new ACM machine programming symposium. It used to be called MAPL, and Alvin was actually a uh, a former uh, program chair, and he's also on the steering committee with me. Uh, so just some legal information, any performance numbers I, I report, your numbers may vary. And if you see different results, feel free to contact me offline and we can chat about those. So what I'd like to discuss with you today is what machine programming is and uh, what we kind of do with uh, NPR research at Intel. Then the three pillars of machine programming, how we sort of have created this nomenclature around machine programming and how we think about it. Then to hit on to what I call the bifurcated space of MP, where I break it down into this uh, stochastic and deterministic uh, segments. And interestingly enough, I actually, uh, just for your FYI, Alvin, I interviewed Armando Solalazama a couple of weeks ago for my channel, and he and I are sort of debating the way that we're classifying things in the stochastic and deterministic uh, segments. So I think it'll be interesting to hear what this, all of your feedback is. One thing that's exciting about machine programming is it's an evolving space. And so those of you who have been um, mostly looking at classical things like uh, classical static analysis, classical programming languages, what you tend to find is in those spaces, everything is very well defined. So for example, if you look at parallel computing, we understand what, uh, how deadlocks emerge and uh, what, what a live lock looks like. But when the field first emerged, we didn't really have definitions for these things. They were sort of found out in the process. And that's sort of where we are with machine programming is we kind of are not there yet where we fully understand the space. And so you'll probably see spaces where I'll, I'll clarify something and say, well, I'm not sure exactly how we define this, but currently this is the way that we're thinking about it. And this is uh, something that I think all of you, if you're interested in this space, you can help contribute is all of you are obviously brilliant young minds. If you're uh, attending Berkeley, I'm a huge fan of Berkeley. Work with, I've worked with Berkeley for a long time. And hopefully you can think about these problems with me and with Alvin and help us sort of define this field as we move forward. Um, so then once we get through the, the stochastic and deterministic part, then we'll talk about some emphasis we have on machine programming at Intel. And then we'll talk about two specific systems, Control Flag, which is a new self-supervised anomaly detection system, and then MISM, our machine inferred code semantic similarity system. And again, feel free to interrupt at any point. And Alvin, would, would you remind me how long do I have? So it, uh, we usually stop at 3.30. Okay. I think like we we can take questions afterwards. So that's not a problem. Okay. Assuming that like people can stay afterwards. So yeah. Okay, excellent. And I think I just see that uh, Melly has joined. That's great. Uh, so yeah, machine programming is really about the automation of the development of software and hardware. And this is important for us to consider this that machine programming is not a uh, rebranding of machine learning. And as you'll see shortly, we use machine learning techniques for machine programming, but we also use things like what Alvin is an expert in, which is more informal methods that doesn't require any machine learning at all. 
principally when we were coming up with machine programming and this idea, it was about software development, but a byproduct of um, the advances in machine programming is that we're now starting to automate hardware development. And this is principally because much of the hardware development that happens is through software development. So for example, if you're starting to look at things like hardware description languages like Verilog or System Verilog, if we can automate the construction of those systems, then we can start to automate the construction of those hardware models. And likewise, as we're starting to test hardware systems, um, much of the sort of deployment that is, uh, or sort of the analysis of verification that goes on through those hardware systems before we can deploy them is through rigorous uh, testing. And if we can automate the construction of those tests, now we can also automate the development of hardware. So hopefully this gives you some intuitive sense on why machine programming is really the automation of both software and hardware. Uh, machine programming research is a new pioneering research initiative at Intel Labs. And basically that just means that we'll, we plan on doing it for the next several decades. And we think of it as a disruptive uh, new technology. Uh, the core tenets of NPR, machine programming research, are really around these two areas, time and quality. Um, being a pioneering research effort, we have to have aspirations that are a bit audacious. So the first aspiration is to exceed a thousand X productivity over what humans can do today. And we'll actually see an example of this shortly that uh, shows that this can be done for some constrained spaces. In addition to that, it's not enough simply to improve the development uh, productivity of software developers, we also need to ensure that certain quality characteristics are maintained. And what I mean by this, these are things like correctness, performance, portability, maintainability, all of these things. So simply improving uh, our ability to synthesize programs by 1000x, if we're churning out programs that are sort of garbage, uh, we're not really doing much. So it needs to be this, this dual thing simultaneously. And as I was mentioned earlier, I like to call this work out just because Alvin is actually involved in this. And so is uh, one of his uh, prior students, uh, Dr. Mazamad, who's now I think at Adobe Research, is a concrete embodiment of this that is able to achieve this temporal speed up as well as these quality characteristics is shown in this paper, automatically translating image processing libraries to Halide. And what they show, which I'll talk about shortly, is using two forms of machine programming, principally um, uh, super, super optimizations in Halide and automated techniques of transpilation using verified lifting. They're able to essentially in, sort of reach this temporal goal of 1000x. And then also, as you can see with this graph here, the quality of the transpiled functions that they're translating improve in one dimension. And that dimension is performance. And what, what is shown here is basically a list of about 300 functions that were translated and the, the geometric mean um, speed up is about 3.36X uh, for these 300 programs. So you can see that we're getting essentially superhuman uh, performance in, in one dimension. Okay, so now that we have sort of a basic idea of machine programming and NPR research, does, does anyone have any questions about that sort of ground level stuff? Okay, I'll continue, but feel free to interrupt if, if something pops up. So one of the core drivers in the way we think about machine programming is around this paper we wrote joint with MIT back in 2018. And it's called the three pillars of machine programming. And what we did is we started this work in about 2016 and we did a deep analysis of the space thinking about what is the future of software development specifically for heterogeneous hardware systems? So at Intel, obviously we're, we're very hardware oriented and we were seeing that there was clear signs that the future of hardware was heterogeneity, not homogeneity. And historically it had been just the CPU at Intel, but now we're starting to look at things like FPGAs and uh, discrete GPUs and uh, neuromorphic computing, quantum computing as, as realizable computing systems, not just sort of something that's science fiction and, and you know 30 years out. So then the question became, how can, we, um, how can we as developers handle 
the programming for that much heterogeneity. And what we quickly realize is that we can't, that there's simply, it's just too challenging essentially for any human being to be an expert at programming all of these different hardware backends. So what we need to do is we need to elide away some of that complexity and have the systems handle that. And that led us to essentially, I guess, discovering or reinventing or whatever, uh, creating these three pillars. The three pillars are intention, invention, and adaptation. Intention is principally about trying to find new ways or improve the current ways that we express our ideas to machines. Um, and then the second part is also lifting the, the meaning from existing software, which we'll talk about in a second. But so the current way that we express intention, generally speaking, to machines is through code. So we write a little code and we're trying to express our intention. Now, one of the things that's, that's fascinating is if you look at almost all the programming languages that exist today, you do a lot more than express intention. You do things like invention. Invention is principally concerned with the data structures and algorithms of that program. And so as you're expressing your intent, you are specifying details of invention. You're essentially taking these existing components, combining them potentially in a unique way, and then sort of realizing your intention through that invention process. And then on top of that, you have the adaptation pillar, which is principally about how to take that higher order program, which is data structures and algorithms, and then potentially adapt it to specific hardware and software ecosystems. So for example, in some of your code, you may have specific like x86 stuff, you have specific ARM things, you have stuff, you have kernels that are specific to GPUs. These are things that we would consider adaptive in nature. And the problem is that as we write code that includes those level of details, what happens is it sort of binds the machine to have a difficult time to disambiguate what the semantic intention of the program is versus what the invention and adaptation pieces are. And the problem with this, at least from my perspective, and I have sneaking suspicion Alvin's is at least somewhat similar, is it sort of conflates these ideas together, which, which can limit the machine from being able to explore all the different options that it could uh, generate to, em to embody the best most correct, most efficient, most secure program for that intention. And what we're trying to shoot for as we move forward are these things called intentional programming languages. A concrete example of probably the closest intentional programming language that I can think of is Halide. If you're not familiar with Halide, I strongly recommend you check it out. Uh, it's created by Jonathan Reagan Kelly out of MIT. He was actually a professor at Berkeley up until recently. And um, the design of Halide is principally for two programmers, which we'll talk about shortly, but one of those programmers only specifies intention. And in discussing with JRK, uh, we think maybe Halide didn't get exactly right. It's very, very close to being intentional, but maybe some invention details leaked over. But as we move forward with that language, we'll hopefully be able to make forward progress on separating out that intention. And uh, the, the, the fourth sort of hidden pillar is data. And this is critical because any machine programming system that exists that I've seen, they all require some form of data. So if you look at the traditional program synthesis techniques that um, are driven by formal methods, they generally use some form of data, usually as input output pairs to do uh, ver verification of the correctness of the program you're trying to generate. And if you look at the more advanced stochastic systems that are sort of emerging today, you see that they tend to they tend to churn and learn on, you know, upwards of like a billion lines of code. So data is essential as the sort of the fourth hidden pillar um, for the three pillars of machine programming. Uh, yeah, so, and then as I was mentioning, the separation of intention is critical for the reasons that I, I kind of got ahead of myself uh, is, the, the, you know, there's several reasons. First of all, it, we believe it can improve productivity. So when you only specify intention, you don't have to include the details of invention and adaptation. So you don't include details of exactly that you're gonna use a red black tree for this container because you may believe that that is the right data structure, but you may not be considering the fact that it may run on a system that has a very large L1 cache and that red black trees are gonna use pointers that might have more cache misses than something like a very streamlined uh, array bound uh, vector for that container, which may seem 
uh, in your mind as a computationally like very inefficient system when you look just at like big O notation, but then when you apply it to practical systems, the actual result may be different. So what we try to do is remove a lot of that decision from the programmer. Don't let him or her or they specify those details. Instead, just say, I have a container and it's going to store these things. And then the machine has the freedom to invent the right data structure that is most efficient for that uh, adaptive system. And um, one concrete embodiment of this and to see this in, in practice is what Alvin and others have done with the Halide verify lifting work in Adobe Photoshop. Um, and so going back to this question about that, actually. So before you go on, so like when you were mentioning about uh, specifying intention, like, so you use this example of uh, red, black trees, right? So in your mind for uh, intentional programming language, does that mean like they, I mean, they need to have like some way to specify some sort of container, right? I mean, like, so, I mean, if, if, if we're taking that away, then how do they even specify? Yeah, so I think that's a great question, Alvin. In, in my mind, as we've been starting to do some of this stuff, and we toyed with a little bit of this with Moz when he was doing his internship with my team a couple of years ago, we tried to create this project called Intentional C++. And what we did is we tried to limit essentially the vocabulary of the language to essentially just sort of these higher level concepts. So for example, to answer your question, instead of being able to specify like a red black tree, we would instead say that you have a container and you don't know what the data structure that is implementing that container is. You simply specify what your intention with that container is. Uh, so you say that I'm gonna put things in this container, I'm gonna search on this container. And this leads to the ability to optimize that under the hood based on uh, what, what Tim Crossby refers to as instance optimized systems. So one way to handle this, to abstract away that, that idea is you say, I have a container and then you give some data a priori to the program that gives it a bit of a signature of what the data will look like when it's running out in the wild. And then it trains on that data and then determines the most efficient data structure under the hood and then binds it to that program. Now, the obvious drawback of this approach is that it's specialized now. So if you now pivot to another data stream, you might very likely won't have the most efficient uh, solution. Or if you pivot to a different ecosystem, you won't. But the idea is that you essentially using data <clears throat> to drive the decisions of the inventive and adaptive systems, but you elide away those concrete embodiments and, 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 and instead present just higher order abstractions. So for example, one of the questions that we have that's open is do we need loops in programming languages that are intentional by nature? Now, if you think about us as humans trying to do something, I think that you may be hard pressed to think of a case where you intentionally are representing something you're doing as a loop. Even if you are doing something that is a loop, we tend to sort of think about things and sort of these stepwise fashion. So I'm going to go drive to the grocery store. I'm going to buy groceries. I'm going to drive home. Now, yes, that's a loop, right? But I didn't specify it as a loop. It's actually three different steps. So one of the ideas is, can we abstract away loops entirely and I, from program, intentional programming languages? And I think Jonathan Reagan Kelly, uh, his take on this, at least when I spoke with him last, is in, at least in the case of Halide, he's tried very hard to eliminate the need for looping mechanisms. And this can help with our representation of intention because loops are actually sort of a not, a not intentional uh, representation for human reasoning. They are really just representations for computer reasoning, if this makes sense. So this is, so just to be clear, I'm, trying, I'm not trying to make a strong claim about this. I don't know what the answer is. But this is sort of the direction that I think we're moving toward with intentional languages. Uh, another concrete embodiment is like SQL. I think SQL, it's obviously a declarative language, but I think that it's very close to intentional. And because it's close to intentional, the byproduct of that is you get these insane query optimizers like Ryan Marcus's BOW system that won the best paper at Sigma this year. Um, if you talk with Ryan, who's part of my team and he's joint uh, postdoc at MIT, 
uh, one of the things that he's told me is a large reason why his query optimizers are able to do so much efficient optimization is SQL prevents the programmer from specifying these details. Almost. Not exactly. There's some stuff that slips in, but for the most part, it's mostly intention. Now, again, it's not perfect. It's not purely intentional. There are some... Um, adaptive details that, that fall through, like the names of tables and things of that nature, or the schema, which then bind it to a specific table structure or schema. But I think maybe you get the general idea is that you are, instead you're saying, I want to do this like uh, sort on this table. And you're not going to tell the machine how to do the sort at all. Let it figure out those details. So you're going to do a join. You're not going to tell it how to do that join or uh, whatever it is that it's trying to do for some like advanced search. And that is I think part of the reason why databases have been able to stick with SQL and been so effective with SQL. I know that there's like, especially talking to Alvin, like he's way more of an expert in databases than I am, but being more of a programming languages person uh, in like systems, so C, C++, I see that one of the downsides of C, C++ is you're allowed to specify so much extra data with like pragmas that then really start to conflate your intention with adaptation. And that's a real problem because now that essentially that creates uh, portability issues, optimization issues, security issues, all of these types of things. Does that kind of answer I mean, that's a very long-winded way of trying to answer your question, Alvin, but did that kind of get a little bit at it? Yeah, sure. I'm just like curious about like, how you draw the line and how can one draw the line I don't have a concrete answer myself. I mean, I don't know whether like, I mean, some people say like go to a bad, right? And some people say like, you know, loops are bad and like, you know, uh, it's kind of like, I don't right. know, I'm curious about your thoughts about like how you, how would you draw the line between? What yeah, and the truth is, this is one of those areas that um, I thought quite a lot about, right? And I don't know, actually. I think that there's some things that are obvious to me that I think you should be lied away. So I think uh, types, for example, uh, data types, in general, I think are probably miss, they're, they're providing too many details of your intention. And that really it's just, you have a thing and the machine should be able to reason about what that type is automatically and then be able to uh, dynamically change that type as the environment changes. Uh, so instead of you know specifying like it's an int 16, and then suddenly now you're an int 32 operating system, now you have to rewrite all this code, uh, because you don't embed that type with the program, it just can naturally evolve as the ecosystem around it evolves. So this is sort of like one of the big upsides I see of intentional programming languages. But the truth is, I also don't know where to draw the line. Um, I, for example, I think go-tos are probably bad, uh, but you know there may be some cases where they're useful. I do think there's an emerging line of thought that loops may be things we can elide away and still capture intentionality. Um, I would love to hear anyone provide a counterexample to that, and maybe that exists. Uh, like Alvin, I'm not married to a clear understanding of what an intentional programming language is. I think the best I can do is I can say, if you think about it in terms of the three pillars, an intentional language is basically something that only lets you specify intention. And then as Alvin has pointed out very quickly is it gets a bit muddled because what is intentional and what's not intentional. I'm not sure how to define that yet. And again, this is one of the things that I think is so exciting about machine programming is the field is evolving literally while we're talking. And so people are working on this, trying to come up with the uh, different ways to reason about this field. And we're sort of in the early stages where we, we actually just don't know yet. That's an excellent question. And I, I have sort of a, an, an audacious, audacious claim to make, which is I believe potentially almost all the bugs that exist in code today and software today are either a misrepresentation of intention or the system has evolved and the software has not evolved with the system. Uh, I believe that once we get intentionality perfectly correct, it's possible the entire field of debugging is eliminated. So think about any bug that you can think about and almost everyone that I can come up with in my head, 
with the exception of potential security vulnerabilities, generally are misrepresentations of intentionality. Uh, so now, going back to your question, sort of conversational programming, and the idea there is you start to specify your intention. And like you pointed out, Parker, I think it's very likely that there will be three things that happen when we specify intention. We will, uh, okay, four things. The fourth is the super unlikely one. We get the intention exactly right. Okay, so that's the fourth one. Now, the three others are we will overspecify. We provide too many details and the machine has to pull us back and say, nope, that's too much. We will underspecify. So we haven't specified enough details for it to reason about something, or we will entirely miss the specification of intention on something. And so the, the canonical example that I use is, let's say that I'm using natural language to present a program. And I can say this, um, computer, notify me anytime I'm near a Starbucks. That's my intention. I've just specified my intention. That's the whole program. Now, the problem is that first it's overspecified. So Starbucks, right? Like why start, do, do I really intend just Starbucks or do I really intend actually any coffee place? So the computer should push back on that. The second is underspecified. What does this alert or near thing mean? Does that mean like it should text me? It should email me? It should call me? And what does near mean? So is, is that uh, a mile away? Is that 10 miles away? Is that hundred yards away? And does that change? Does that near intentionality change based on my mode of transportation? So if I'm on foot, does near need to, does the system, and now you can probably see why this becomes so powerful when you get intentionality right, because then it can adapt itself to these different modes sort of automatically if you only specify intention, right? So you, you work through this and this is sort of like this emerging field of conversational programming. Um, and these are some of the steps that I think we're seeing in, in the space to try to nail down intentionality properly. Um, yeah, and, and there's there's a bunch of work that's emerging obviously with uh, natural language to programming language stuff. Uh, I think that's also super interesting because you're going from essentially an ambiguous unstructured language, which is generally the mode of our, our spoken communication. I don't know any natural language that is uh, unambiguous and perfectly structured, and maybe it exists, but I, I'm not aware of those. But programming languages tend to be actually the opposite. Um, the ambiguity part, I think, can still be there, right? I think the the you can have something that is ambiguous in in code, and it can sort of figure itself out along the way, like dynamic typing, right? But um, the structured part tends to be there in all programming languages that I've seen. I don't know of a single programming language that is not structured uh, in some capacity. So that that's another way that this is happening is we are in these sort of interesting, so it's like a feedback loop type thing where you're having this conversation, whether it's through code or some other mechanism, and then also uh, changing the landscape. So saying, no, no, we're not even gonna communicate through code, we're gonna communicate through natural language and the machine will figure out the semantic meaning of those, uh, of those pros and then convert that and synthesize the program that's associated with that semantic intention, like um, GitHub Copilot, for example. Uh, did that answer your question? Thank you. These are these are wonderful questions. It shows like tremendous insight. Uh, so yeah, basically, I think part of what has happened here uh, with with this example is separation of intention. And I'll get to that in, in just a second. So this is the sort of running example that we'll look at. And what's interesting is, um, just so you know, Alvin, I use this example, not just for your class, um, usually when I'm presenting to try to illustrate the separation of intention, I use this uh, example. So I'm not just picking it because you're here. I think this is actually a really good, it sort of hits all three pillars, I think, in some capacity. Okay, so now we can move on to the bifurcated space of MP. And this is the part that Armando Solar Lozama and I, uh, I guess, are, are sort of debating about. He has a slightly different view. Uh, I don't know that we know what the actual answer is to this, but let me just sort of present to you what we kind of are thinking today. But this is a part that is very much in flux. So this, you know, so the three pillars of machine programming, we think we have that nailed down. I'm not saying that we're right, 
but we sort of published that paper and a lot of people are sort of adopting that uh, nomenclature. The second piece, this is work in progress. So we're working on a paper that's discussing this and we've wrapped our heads around this and thought about it. And what we currently have are these two sides. I don't necessarily think that this is correct, but this is one possible way of thinking about machine programming. So the core idea is that machine programming can be done in many ways. A lot of people think when I talk about machine programming, I mean ML for code. I absolutely do not mean that. Okay, that is one way that you can do this. You can do things like GitHub Copilot or Tab9, um, if you're familiar with it, it's like auto completion or Telesense or whatever, right? Um, and those are using like Control Flag, which we'll talk about in a second, very much machine learned probabilistic systems. But it doesn't have to be just stochastic in nature. It can also be using these formal methods. And the formal methods, uh, depending on the type that you use, may provide you with a certain level of determinism that may not be possible with the stochastic system. So for example, when you have some of these formal methods, oftentimes you can use things like mathematical uh, solvers, you know, theorem provers, essentially, to provide a mathematical guarantee about some property that it must be enforced for some, some data, right? And once that's achieved, it's no longer um, stochastic in some sense that you have sort of guaranteed that it will fulfill all of these. So like counterexample inductive guided synthesis. Um, yeah, yeah counterexample guided inductive synthesis. Uh, that will, as I understand it, sort of walk through these examples and, and it'll ensure that the examples still maintain the correct input output for every uh, different step. But ML techniques don't necessarily do that. So you can train a deep neural network on some data and you can start getting, you know, through back propagation or whatever, the right answers. But as you move through the data, you can start to change the way that the, the weights are, or the values of the weights. And then that can actually change the results that you had previously, right? So you can actually break the prior things that worked uh, as you're moving along through these stochastic systems. And also, as we know, you know, these stochastic systems, they're, they're principally based on um, statistical analysis, right? Probability that, that we don't have this formal mathematical uh, background on these systems. Now, what's interesting though, is there's emerging work that is using both of these things simultaneously. And, oh yeah, and, and so stochastic systems tend to use more IID data, right? So this is independent, um, uh, identically distributed data. Right? And you want that because then you get all the quadrants covered. And I'm sure all of you know this. Um, so, and you know, we go back to Alvin's paper. The way I like to think about it is like this, is it uses a fusion of two things. Uh, on one side, it uses halide, which is using a stochastic optimizer, uh, which I think it's using like a tree convolution. And it's just iteratively is trying to optimize based on a, a variety of parameters. And at some point it either reaches some critical mass and it, it stops or you can intervene, right? And that's completely, or let, let's not say completely, but that is largely driven by stochastic principles. On the other hand, to get the semantics out of the code. So you have code that's at C, C++ and you're gonna lift upwards. This um, is done using more formal methods that you have, you, what you're trying to do is uh, ensure that the semantics that are in the original program also exist in the higher order representation. And, you know, obviously this is Alvin's work, so he knows it much better than I do. But the way I think about it is you essentially are constructing a higher order Lambda calculus that's in the form of domain specific language that's capturing your intention, right? And then it's lifting out the semantics to store that in that DSL. And then it does the semantic verification based on the data that both of those systems essentially give you the same output based on some set of input. But this is a formally verified approach. Now it's the fusion of both of these things together that gives you this amazingness that they got from this paper in my mind. So the first step is you use this formal system to lift out the semantics, then you lower to halide, okay? Which is an intentional programming language, right? At least, you know, the way I think about it. And then because intention is only specified, what happens is it frees the machine to explore the space of invention and adaptation, which allows it to do superhuman optimizations. Okay, that was probably a lot to digest, but I realize all of you are super smart. Are there any questions about that high level explanation?
I actually have a question. Um, Alvin, since you're sort of the, you know, your co-author on this paper, um, do, do, you, do you agree with the way that I assess this and sort of categorize it, or do you disagree? Um, actually, I'm, I was going to ask you another question about that. So like, so if something actually uses, let's say, like stochastic method, right, in terms of finding a semantically equivalent translation, how would you categorize? How you, yeah, how would you categorize that? I mean, so is that stochastic or is that deterministic? And, and, and this Yeah, and this is where Armando and I are fighting, right? Is that, and, and to be honest, Armando's probably right, right? Because Armando's way smarter than I am. But um, the, the way that I think about it is, I think the, the principal divider that we need to think about is that one of these is very much based, like, like I show in this, in this slide back here, as we move to more stochastic solutions, it become progressively more approximate in nature. And as we move to more deterministic, it become progressively more precise. So it's not like there's a clear line really anywhere in there. It's sort of this just it's a, a lot of uh, shades of gray. But the way I think about it is that if the technique that's being used for the MP system is principally based on formal methods, some sort of formal mathematical driver, then I would put it in the deterministic category, even if it has stochastic elements inside of the solver. And this is where Armando and I are sort of debating, as he's pointed out, obviously, which is totally correct, is that you can have stochastic elements in formal methods because you can use um, various stochastic initializers for like the variables. And then different runs of sketch will actually give you different output for you know, the, the same problem because of that initialization of those variables that are stochastic. But you can also make it deterministic. You can seed those to a specific value, and then it will be deterministic, fully re re repeatable each time. And so this is where it gets a little bit hand wavy, and we're not entirely sure. I don't know that these are exactly the right words. But I think the important piece to walk away from, at least from my perspective, is that when we think of machine programming, it is not just ML for code. And I'll show you an example of that in a minute. But also that you can use these formal techniques that are not machine learning. And it's the fusion of these two that really, in my mind, is the heart of the emerging research. If you are just doing ML for code, I'm kind of bored. Okay, like I've been there, I've done that. It's not super interesting. If you're just using like SAT solvers, okay, that's cool. But you know, we've been doing that for 70 years. Um, but if you're doing the fusion of these two together, then I think you start to get into this really interesting space that's largely unexplored. And that's kind of the way that, that I think about it. What, what, do you, what do you think about that, Alvin? Yeah, I think that's a great idea. I was actually going to ask like another meta question about like how like what are we going to how what what lessons can we learn from doing this type of um characterization right between stochastic versus deterministic but i think you just mentioned you, yeah you just answered that question so yeah I th and i think that's a great agenda yeah and um the the part that yeah armando doesn't like about this is and i think he's absolutely correct on this so i want to say that i you know there's there's very few people on this planet that I think probably understand machine programming better than I do, just because I spent the last six years just thinking about it 24 hours a day. But Armando Solaro Lazama is probably one of the people, you know, as well as you know, Alvin Chung, that I would say, okay, this person potentially knows more about MP than I do. So I think Armando's right in that this deterministic label is not exactly right because these formal methods can be stochastic. But what I'm really trying to get at here is that there's a there's a probabilistic ap approach to this, and then there's sort of this mathematically guaranteed approach. And it's it's really the fusion of those two that lead us to really exciting stuff. So hopefully, you know, if you can come up with better names, so we haven't published the paper that we're working on actually for this, um, it's in flight. And we've actually changed the names of these several times, just like we did with the three pillars. Uh, to be totally transparent, the third pillar used to be, in the first incarnation, it was automation. And then one of my colleagues, uh, Dr. Tim Matson, said, this is totally wrong. It, it needs to be um, adaptation. And then he sort of explained the reasoning. I was like, oh, yes, this is obviously right. Uh, so, you know, for those of you that have been doing research for a while, I suspect this is very common. 
uh, knowing this sort of uh, iterative process that we haven't quite figured things out and that's what makes it research. For those of you that are new to research, this might seem a little bizarre that I'm here giving a lecture and I'm saying, well, this is the way I think about it, but just know that this is probably wrong. And you're probably thinking, why is this guy giving a lecture at Berkeley? <laughs> he doesn't even know what he's talking about. And that's actually what I tend to find when you're on the bleeding edge of research is you actually don't have all the answers. So if, in my personal view, after doing this for like 15 years, if you find yourself in a quandary of research where you don't have all the answers for your research, it's probably a good thing. That probably is a good space to be in. Because if you did have all the answers, you're probably actually just doing engineering. Uh, that's a strong claim, but you know. Okay, uh, so now we can move on to the last section. Uh, yeah, so this will easily take 30 minutes. Um, there are, when I started working on machine programming back in 2016 at Intel, it was basically an effort of one person. Uh, so it was just me trying to convince this 100,000 plus uh, employee uh, company to investigate this field. And a lot of people were like, no, you're crazy. You know, this is, this is never gonna happen. And then slowly we started to see work emerge. What we've seen in transition from 2016 of being a one person effort to 2021 is we now have uh, thousands of people at Intel working on machine programming. And we have uh, an entire startup, uh, Intian, that has launched uh, a couple of years ago. That's all about machine programming. We have my lab, which is all about machine programming. Uh, machine programming is a pioneering research effort. So it's one of the initiatives for the whole company essentially. And there are many different, there's probably several dozen organizations within Intel that are adopting machine programming in some capacity. So the, the curve is kind of looking like this. And that makes me super excited because it shows that this is not just a research toy. And I think Alvin's work with um, uh, the, the stuff that he has in Adobe Photoshop version 21 is a compelling concrete example of that. If this is just a research toy, there's likely no way this makes it into production. And I'll also show you some examples of other MP systems that we've built that have had like similar results. But one thing I wanna quickly point out is this importance of data. Now, earlier I was saying the fourth hidden pillar is, is data, right? So if you look at our MISM system, which I'm gonna describe shortly, uh, just know that when we are using 400,000 labeled data samples, we essentially beat the state of the art by about two X. So we're, we're, we're about, yeah, a two X better than the, the best competing system. But when MIT and IBM ran their own survey against the same state of the art systems, so the same systems that we compared against, they saw upwards of a 5X improvement in our system over the state of the art. And the takeaway from this is we haven't done a deep uh, experimental analysis to understand why this improvement is so profound, uh, but we have a stinging suspicion that has something to do with the fact that they have twice the amount of data. And as you probably, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the stochastic systems, they tend to do much better with more IID data. And this is, I think, potentially a, a concrete embodiment of what that looks like. When you get more IID data and you're building a stochastic, principally a stochastic MP system, you can see pretty awesome performance improvements. Okay, so now um, let's talk a little bit about what we can do without label data, because a lot of the MP systems that are, that are emerging have to work on code and or some variant of code, like an abstract syntax tree or the context aware semantic structure and so on and so forth, right? Um, so the question is, what can we do when we just have code or some representation where we have no labels? Because clearly like this is a, a serious challenge if we wanna be able to harness like the power of GitHub, right? But before we dive into that, let's just take a quick look at why we might target debugging for machine programming. If you look at a study that was done by University of Cambridge back in 2017, they basically broke down the software development cost to 50% uh, being all of software development is debugging. Uh, we did a back of the envelope calculation for software development costs in 2020, and it's around $2 trillion. That means approximately $1 trillion is spent today use uh, just debugging. So if we can even improve debugging by 
we essentially will save upwards of $10 billion. So hopefully you're compelled by why we might want to build machine programming systems that target debugging. Uh, so that's one of the areas that we target. And uh, one of the first systems I'll talk about now is control flag. But before we talk about control flag, we have to give a little background on what a code anomaly is. So code anomaly is a piece of code that is irregular in, in some, some dimension. And what we mean by irregular is not necessarily that it's a defect. It simply means that it is something that is just non-normal. It could be that it's obfuscated code, which means like maybe it's just hard to understand and people have harder time to ramp up on that code. It could be that it's um, code that is going to lead to a defect. So we'll see an example of that in a, in a second, or it could be that it actually is a concrete defect. And we'll see a, an example of that. But so keep in mind the, the code anomalies, what's interesting about them is they can be useful in detecting not just as a reactive mechanism for fixing code, but as a proactive mechanism for fixing code that we can actually look at code and say, this is probably going to turn into a bug. You should fix this now. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. Let's, let's take a look at, at one of these code anomalies. So there's this uh, piece of software out there called curl, a client URL. And this has been around for about 30 years and it's supposedly used upwards of a billion times a day. So I think that us being on Zoom, I think we're probably using curl in some capacity. Uh, I think when I share the videos, it's probably invoking curl uh, or sharing the slides, invoking curl, sharing your videos, you're probably invoking curl. And so this is, this is very hardened production quality code. So we're not looking at these little toy programs. And what we found with an analysis of curl is this sort of interesting uh, quandary. Now, if you're not familiar with uh, C, C++, uh, what I can tell you is that uh, in general, um, the value associated with false is zero. And the values that are associated with true are anything that is not zero. So false is zero. Anything that's not zero is true. So then what does it mean for something to be greater than true? Like this is, is, is very is sort of confusing to me. And so control flag found this and keep in mind, we don't tell, we don't actually program control flag with any rules. So it, it just learns this stuff on the fly, which I'll explain in a second. Uh, but it found this and we saw it and we're like, yeah, this is really confusing. We contacted the curl team. They said, yes, this is, this is obfuscated code. This is not right. And this is probably going to lead to a bug. It's a byproduct actually that it works. So they're misspecifying their intention. What their intention is the code in the green. So what they really meant to do is create this enum that has these different states. And they were just hijacking this Boolean uh, type system to try to force fit it into something that it wasn't really meant for. And, and that's what the, the intention mismatch was. And so they went in, they acknowledged our, our finding and they, they updated their code. So that's, that's a concrete example of code that I think is a, a good example of something that is not necessarily a bug, but it only works because of a byproduct in the system. And that as soon as we slightly change something, then that byproduct might go away. And now that bug emerges. Okay. Now there are a bunch of uh, code anomaly detectors that exist today. Um, they they you know, do these things like, uh, you know, we have our unit tests, we have quality assurance, we have static analyzers. Uh, compilers and linters, all of these are doing uh, detecting anomalies. So your compiler is telling you like, is this syntactically correct? The linters are generally saying like, is there something abnormal here? The tests are telling us whether or not, you know, we pass through the behavior of the program the right way. So they're all essentially trying to detect anomalies in different ways. But the problem with all of these approaches is, at least historically, is that they all require manual effort to update and maintain. So a human has to come in and define what the intermediate representation is. So Chris Latner had to come in and construct uh, LLVM and MLIR. So he had to figure that out in his head and a whole bunch of people have to work on this. Um, same thing with these linters, right? And same thing with all these tests. So a human is coming in. And the problem with that is that potentially becomes a resource bottleneck to find these anomalies. 
because we're limited to just the things that we can think of in our own heads. And what we've seen with machines, especially from Alvin's example, is that the machine, when given the freedom of being able to explore intention on its own, it can actually find stuff that it may be better than the best humans can. And we have concrete data of that, right? With Adobe Photoshop is we see it actually, yes, it had a geometric mean uh, speed up of 3.36X. It's just better. Uh, so these are the limitations. And because of these limitations, that led us to build control flag. What control flag is basically, it detects anomalous code and you have a high level overview of the system here. If you wanna read more about it, you can check out our MAPS uh, 2021 paper uh, written by myself and my colleague, uh, Dr. Narajan Hospinas. And the higher order bit here with control flag is basically this. One, it's self-supervised. So it doesn't require any labels to do its learning. So the only part that humans are involved in are, is this piece right here. Humans have to figure out the semi-trust. And we actually have created a heuristic that we use that figures this out for us. So we wrote a small program that helps us determine if it's a code repository that we think we can trust. And again, very hand wavy, right? Like what does semi-trust mean? Well, you know, it's basically it's the idea that we think we can trust the code to some degree. It doesn't mean that we think the code is perfect. It doesn't mean that it necessarily is, is gonna be super performant or won't have security vulnerabilities because that stuff is gonna be really challenging to prove. But again, we have an abundance of code. So how can we harness that? Well, what if we just go with this notion of semi-trust where we look at environmental data that tells us that this code is like being used a lot or you know, like curl, right? It's used a billion times a day or it has 300 contributors or it's been around for 20 years. Usually these indicators of that, that type of data give us some degree of confidence that we can look at this code and it might tell us something useful. So that's the only piece that humans are involved in. The rest of it, it figures out on its own. So it, it basically mines for only control structures. And that part's super important because what we observed in survey data is, so control structures are, all of you, I'm sure no, just as a refresher, control structures are things essentially that control the flow of the program. So if statements, for loops, um, exception handling, all that stuff. So control flag only looks at control structures. And the idea behind this is that we found that principally the majority of bugs uh, live in control structures. That people tend to get things like X is less than Y wrong when they really meant X is less than or equal to Y. Or uh, if X equals Y, when they really meant if X is equal to Y, right? We find that these types of bugs emerge much more commonly than someone saying um, container.sort, right? When they really meant like container.first, right? So these instruction level um, sort of idiosyncratic uh, mismatches on patterns tend to be less frequent than uh, mismatches on conditional uh, control flow expressions. And part of the reason why we also only mine control structures is that we're gonna mine a billion lines of code. And this is gonna be computationally very intense. So we need to find a way to make it computationally tractable. And what we can do is we can elide away like 90% of the code because it's not a, it's not a control structure. So that's not saying that there, there won't be bugs in that, like a double free is a concrete example of two instructions that are just instructions, not a control flow or a control structure um, bug. And it's just, yeah, it's something that control flag would miss. But the upside is that by lighting away all those other instructions, it makes control flag computationally feasible in its training. And it can learn on significantly large, larger corpa than would be possible if we mined all of the code. Okay, and then the last piece that's super important is with control flag, uh, it doesn't require compilation. And we thought this would be an important piece because we wanted to be able to support it in a live environment where people could be writing code and as they're writing code, it can say, no, I think you're wrong about this. I think you just introduced an anomaly. And so these are the three design takeaways for control flag. If Again, if you're interested in more, you can read this paper. Um, we have more data uh, on it there. Uh, so we, we built this system and then we, we trained it on 6,000 GitHub repositories, um, uh, approximately 1.1 billion lines of code. And the next largest MP system that we had built was trained on something like an order of tens of millions of lines of code. So this is two orders of magnitude larger 
than any prior system, prior MP system that we built on the training data. I think this is still something like two orders of magnitude smaller than the data that GitHub uh, Copilot is trained on with its Codex system. I think its Codex is trained on something like 100 billion lines of code. And so we're only like 1 billion lines of code. But largely that's because of the semi-trust issue is that we're very particular about the code that we learn from. So there's lots more code out there that we could have learned from, but we intentionally don't look at that code because we're not confident that it can tell us something meaningful. So then after we trained this, we looked at a few different very hardened open source repositories like uh, Git, for example, uh, and it actually found various anomalies in all these. Now we haven't gone through each of these repos uh, individually just because we haven't had the bandwidth, but every anomaly that we've reported to the open source community, they have acknowledged, said, yes, this is either a bug or this is a, a mis-expression of intention and something. In fact, if you go to the Control Flag uh, GitHub website, you can see we're having debates with different people reporting that a control flag found something. They're like, they don't think this is an anomaly. And then we get in this very detailed discussion. And then finally it's like, oh, you're right. Yes, this is an anomaly. Um, we're still going to leave it in because we don't know how to make it better, but we're not a comment that says this is happening as a byproduct of this, you know, do not trust this code, but we don't know how to make it better right now. Uh, so there's actually an example of this happening uh, today uh, that, that came up. So uh, th this makes us pretty excited, but we also tested it on proprietary and deployed software. So I can't tell you where this code came from, uh, but I can tell you that it is production quality code and it's been in deployment for several years. Uh, what Control Flag found are essentially three different defects. Uh, we don't really have the time to go into all of these defects, but the, the one that's the most interesting is uh, this one, I think, because uh, this one's the most dangerous. So what Control Flag found is this mod four to be particularly bizarre. And so by default, and this is this is kind of what's I think very interesting about a lot of the MP systems you're seeing today, like GitHub Copilot uh, or Tab9 or even Control Flag is what we do is we give the humans hints, but we don't actually do anything concrete, unlike verified lifting, right? Where verified lifting can do um, fully closed loop transpilation. And then it can guarantee that if it transpiles it, that it's correct. And if it fails the transpilation process, then it can't guarantee it and it's gonna take a step back. Whereas the more stochastic systems, right? This is sort of going back to your question, Alvin, why I draw this line is what I find is these deterministic systems can generally be more closed loop, but the stochastic systems, especially when you're concerned with correctness, usually need at least today, a human in the loop to verify them. Now, if it's not a question of sort of discreteness in terms of correctness, like it's something like performance improvement, then I think you can get away without humans in the loop. Because in that case, intentionality is no, you know, always better performance is, is the goal. So as you're testing the performance of the system, assuming you have the right like cost model estimators, then you just know you're getting better. Whereas these, these correctness, correctness ones can be challenging, I think sometimes for the system to know, was that really what you intended? So Control Flag finds this mod four, and uh, we stared at this and thought, yeah, this is pretty bizarre. Uh, this is really some poorly written code because that mod four was, that literal is burned right into that code. So just as a, a, my piece of advice to all of you, uh, you know, up and coming rock stars, uh, please don't embed literals directly into your code. Like pull those things out and, you know, use constants to represent them because they're going to change. So this four is meant to be a four byte alignment. That's what they're trying to do here. But um, what's interesting is that I'll just, okay, I'll just quickly walk through these. Okay, so the first is a, a duplicate expression. So this is just the programmer being lazy, that it shouldn't be copy pasted here. Because now if I update this, but I forget to update this, now I've introduced a bug. So that, that's the first bug. That's sort of like um, just a, um, a technical debt issue. The second one is an out of bounds memory access. So what happens is imagine that the value in, in this um, dereference on, on this two dimensional array gives you back the value two. If it gives you back value two, mod four will give you two. That's non-zero value, which means the if is true. Then you'll do this P16 minus one. So P16 is a, uh, two byte pointer. So it'll do subtraction, it'll jump it back to zero. So now the result that's stored in there is zero. Now, when you dereference P32, you'll dereference a zero uh, 
a null pointer, uh, a, a zero value uh, pointer, and that will hopefully cause the system to crash. If it doesn't, um, you're probably even more trouble because who knows? I think actually C++ may say that that's undefined behavior, um, but that's 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 a really bad one. But then the, the worst one is this one on uh, line 11. So what's happening here, and keep in mind, we didn't, control flag didn't detect this. This took analysis with humans, but control flag again gives us the hint that like something isn't quite right about this code. So when we looked a little bit deeper, what's happening is this is a raw pointer being allocated dynamically, but there's no check on the upper bounds for index. So this can jump out of memory and jump into confidential memory, privileged memory. And if you're really smart, I can get this to jump to a location in your instruction cache, and I can preload the instruction cache with my own instructions, and I've just rooted your system. Yeah, really nasty. So needless to say, this bug was fixed as soon as there were all three of these were fixed as soon as it was found. But these are the kinds of cool things that control flag can find. And what's really exciting is um, we didn't we didn't program any rules inside of control flag. So all of the things that it's figuring out, these are things that it's learned on its own. One of the things that I think is probably the most exciting is at one point it came back and I think yeah, here we go. So here's like a high level overview of this first repo. And you can see that it's it's finding these things where you're missing these null checks. So if you're familiar with pointers, you know that oftentimes you want to check against null first. And if it is null, then you want to sort of exit. And if it is not null, then the assumption is this is valid memory and I can do something meaningful on it. Um, what's fascinating to us is that control flag learned what pointers were on its own. So just contemplate that for a second. I remember when I was first learning pointers in undergrad, and I remember thinking, wow, this is like complicated stuff. This is this is usually like the, the first bar of filtering, computer science, right? It's like pointers and recursion. If you if you can't get these two concepts, you're sort of kicked out. And now imagine a system that on its own can learn not only what pointers are, but then how to access pointers in a safe way without any pre-programming of those rules. That part was like really exciting to us. It's also very scary, right? Because um, this thing's self-evolving. And so this is this is why I think you really do need to be concerned with um, the ethics of AI. This is a very serious thing that we need to have safeguards and safety rails uh, in place. Um, now, this, this is not all to say that uh, control flag is perfect. This doesn't show the false positives. In this case, I think the false positives were about 50% of the things that's resulting. Now we can control that, but it's usually with a dial. And so this is reporting, I think on 1% of all of the anomalies that it sees. We can turn the dial down to like 0.1, but the problem is then it re removes some of the true positives. So we're still working on improving this. We have lots of ideas, but um, just to be to have scientific integrity, it's not all puppy dogs and rainbows, that so there, there are some byproducts here that it's not a perfect system that, uh, it has zero false positives. And usually I find in real world anomaly detectors that are actually solving really hard problems, you likely have a trade-off that you either choose to have more false positives or you choose to have false negatives, but you have to make a choice. You can't have both zero. And so we prefer, I mean, it depends on the type of thing that you're looking at. So the, the canonical example is if you're trying to detect cancer, it's better to have false positives, right? You want to have, you want to detect that someone does have cancer and they don't have cancer and then send them home. You don't wanna have a false negative where you miss someone, they have cancer, you could have fixed it. And the opposite is like um, spam, uh, spam control systems for email. You tend to wanna to prefer false negatives, right? Is that you can miss emails that are spam, but you cannot take email that is not spam and drop it in a spam folder, right? So usually there's trade-off. And so in this case, we're, the trade-off is we're choosing more false positives over false negatives. And then, yeah, we ran this on a second repository across um, you know, 65 million lines of code and it identified a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, so it's being integrated into like the, the potentially the, the back end of this partner, this Intel partners, uh, continuous integration, continuous development environment, CICD. Okay, now I just spoke a whole lot over the last 30 minutes, pretty much nonstop. Are there any questions about any of that?
so first of all, I think your observation is absolutely correct, is that the, you know, as I was mentioning before, I think that most of the defects or all the defects I've seen are all miscommunications of intention. And so like that keep on is greater than true. Like that's just, what is that? That's just not getting it right. And so as we get more intentional programming language, I think it becomes harder to write bugs. And the two concrete examples of intentional programming languages that I can think of that I think are probably the most intentional, although I think Alvin's work with verified lifting, that higher order Lambda calculus, so the domain specific, so the stuff that he's working on um, in, in Dexter or the prior systems, I think those are also very intentional, but the problem with those in my mind, and this is not a, a bash on your work, Alvin, this is more just um, thinking about global adoption is, I think that very few people can reason about programs at that level, at that formal analysis, like Lambda calculus level. Uh, probably everyone on this call can, but if you're not a super like mathematical genius, you have a strong background in computer science, you likely have no idea what's being represented. Uh, so, but that is one way to represent attention, I think. And that, that's a really good example of clearing out the clutter because system level details are alighted away. The, the other two that I think of are SQL and Halide. Uh, so SQL, it's, again, it's declarative in nature, but I think if you look at the language itself, it's pretty good in some sense about not letting you over-specify how things are done. And I think that's the core thing, is you generally don't want to allow the programmer to specify how things are done. You only want to let the programmer specify what they want to do not how that thing will be done. And also I think very similar thing happens with Halide, which I thought I had an example of, but it must be um, in a different slide deck. So yeah, I think it's an excellent question. And I think as we move forward in the space, uh, we, will, um, we will likely invent more intentional programming languages. So I think Halide is just sort of the beginning. I mean, Python obviously is moving toward higher level abstractions. So I think in some sense it's more intentional than C or C++. But a big downside of, of Python is it, it, its performance can be pretty abysmal. So, I, but I think with intentional languages, you can actually subvert these things is you can be more productive by capturing intention properly. And you can allow the MP backend to do the inventive and adaptive portions that actually make it more portable, more efficient, more correct, all that stuff. Uh, so does that sort of answer your question? Okay. The biggest problems we have is all the intentional languages that exist. And I think Alvin's trying to sort of work on this with his Metalift stuff is trying to take specialized systems and open them up to be more generalized. But to the best of my knowledge, there is no general purpose intentional programming language that exists today. And part of that I think is it's very hard to identify what the, what the properties of that programming language should be to cover all domains while simultaneously restricting the programmer from specifying intention and adaptive portions of the program, which is why I think you, you know, as you, I think correctly observed, uh, SQL and Halide, they are very domain specific. So Halide is specifically for image processing. That's, I mean, I suspect Jonathan Reagan Kelly would say it can do more than that, but it, it's, I think he will admit it's a DSL, right? And then the same thing for SQL, it's a DSL, right? It's, it's only with databases. You're not using this to write, you know, build your next web browser. So I do think this is one of the core challenges. This is an open problem in space as far as I'm concerned. I don't know how to create an intentional programming that is general purpose. I don't know that even if, if, um, even if we do that, it will necessarily be possible to restrict invention and adaptation. So maybe we get it to where, yes, it's largely intentional, but to make a general purpose, we have to leak in some things. So I think it's possible there'll be trade-offs. Uh, my sneaking suspicion is we will likely have, I mean, just to, just to be honest about the practicality of it, I think likely we will see an emergence of intentional programming languages that are domain specific. And that will likely be the trend for the next few decades. 
And maybe we'll start working on solutions that can do like transpilation between each intentional DSL to another intentional DSL. But that would be not part of a general purpose uh, intentional language. At least that's kind of you know my honest answer about where I think the space is today. Uh, we've thought about this quite a bit. I mean, I saw, again, your intuition is fantastic. I, I love all these questions because um, you're really hitting on some of the core challenges is uh, we don't know. So I, I asked Jonathan, I, I asked um, uh, Kayvon Fadahalin, he's a professor at Stanford, works on the Halide stuff. I asked um, uh, Andrew Adams, who is uh, one of the lead architects for the Halide system, and Jonathan Ring Kelly, all the same question. Can Halide generalize? Kayvon says, no. Andrew says, no. Jonathan says, maybe. And so, but I think that the point, the takeaway here is that, uh, yeah, we, we uh, this could be a real problem. Thank no, you. thank you. Yeah. So Alvin, we're at 331. I have an entire section that I haven't even started on. This is great. This, this gives me a good bar for the pace that I'll move for MIT. And I was going to talk about code semantics. Um, but it would it would take way too long. So should I just jump to kind of the end or what would you like me to do? Yeah, I think that might be better because I think some folks might have classes. Okay. So um, if you maybe jump to a conclusion slide and then we can conclude. And then for those of you who have questions and would like to ask afterwards, then they can stick, they can stick, stick around. Perfect. That. that sounds great. Yeah. And okay. maybe this is... Um, future uh, lecture material for the spring or something is we can mm -hmm. try to get this to be a two-part series so I can talk about uh, code semantics. Uh, but yeah, so code semantics, I'm gonna skip over this section, but I think that th this part is, I think really important right here is this is how I envision compilers will be in the future is I think Alvin's work um, on verified lifting, this is what we're gonna do to get super optimizing compilers because right now compilers essentially go down. I think that the future is up, uh, but uh, we'll, we'll save that for a future discussion. So let me just jump right to the end. Um, so yeah, we covered what we, we almost covered everything. We didn't get to miss them, uh, but we covered essentially the research charter for NPR, what the three pillars of machine programming are, the bifurcated space that's still in development. And by the way, please do email me and tell me that I'm wrong because I don't think we've got this right. And I would love to hear your thoughts on this. And just as a final uh, sort of reminder that uh, machine programming is growing all across Intel and all across industry and academia. In fact, on my interview with Alvin, I think he and I discussed it on my YouTube channel how well, we, we think machine programming is the future. Like, it's just very obvious that this is where it's going. So if you're interested in this space and you are a PhD track, uh, please reach out to me because my team is hiring and we are actually talking with a few people at Berkeley. So I think Melly is actually on the call here. Um, and then some heads up just for future things. Uh, yeah, so teaching some of the MP fundamentals at obviously Berkeley and MIT. We have a new machine programming research center that is being launched. It's a $5 million five-year center that's joint with Intel and NSF. And we have the MAPS um, symposium that this year is being led by um, Professor and Dr. Charles Sutton, who's now at Google AI. And Alvin and I are involved in that effort as well. And if you're interested in more details, you can follow all this work on our website, LinkedIn, Twitter, all that stuff. So with that, I think that uh, I'm done. Great, thank you so much, Justin. Great, thank you. Great, thank you for the great lecture. Um, so in the interest of time, I'm gonna stop recording now. And for those of you who have questions, please stay around, assuming Justin, you have time. Oh, um, absolutely. Some questions. Okay, great. All right, thanks everyone first. And then if you have questions, please, please feel free to ask. <laughs>